When I think of some of the best animated television series of the 1980s, one that certainly comes to mind is The Raccoons. This Canadian cartoon, created by Kevin Gillis, managed to tackle some major themes with plenty of depth and humor, and created an endearing world and ensemble as we follow the animals living in the evergreen forest. Most people recall it for the environmental themes, but the stories actually had a lot of variety to them, and that allowed the raccoons to remain fresh and entertaining through its five seasons on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation television network. And I'm going to celebrate the show today and why it holds up so well. The Raccoons actually began life as a series of television specials, starting with the Christmas Raccoons in 1980. This was followed by The Raccoons on Ice in 1981 and The Raccoons and the Lost Star in 1983. These were charming and humorous specials that successfully introduced audiences to Bert, Ralph, and Melissa Raccoon, in addition to Schaefer the Sheepdog, the villainous tycoon Aardvark, Cyril Sneer, and his son Cedric. It's impressive how well realized these characters already were in their initial appearances, although Lost Star is a bit of an odd special, as it has Schaefer flying to another planet and meeting aliens who are exact copies of the Evergreen Forest residents. It does explain why Brew the Puppy has that star in his collar, though. These three specials were huge ratings hits for CBC, so it's no surprise that Raccoon's television series was eventually greenlit. They also performed well in the United States, which led Disney Channel to provide additional funding for the series in addition to the option to air it on the network. The Raccoons was such a big deal for the CBC, they aired the show in prime time, rather than the expected Saturday morning slot usually reserved for cartoons at the time. The television series displayed a lot of sophistication in its writing, animation, and even the music. What's amazing when revisiting the series is seeing how the characters grow and evolve. Kevin Gillis was not intent on keeping the raccoons stagnant, and we see them encounter new challenges and adventures. This is probably most evident with Cyril Sneer, who is not written like your traditional cartoon antagonist. He was certainly greedy and did things for his own gain, which oftentimes blew up in his face when he met his comeuppance. However, Cyril also had his own morals, and had lines he would not cross. He also had a genuine affection for Cedric, even if he did not always agree with him. As the series progressed, so did Cyril. In the beginning of the show, he was not opposed to causing destruction and trying to stop the raccoons at any cost. However, by the end of the series, Cyril is a full-blown environmentalist. A lesser animated show would have kept Cyril the exact same and not have him evolve beyond a cigar-chomping, tree-cutting baddie. There are even episodes where it's Cyril who gives someone a motivational pep talk, and more often than not, it's his pig assistants who are the sneakier, more underhanded residents of Sneer Manor. Then there are the raccoons themselves, who are summarily fleshed out. Bert has his bumbling moments, but we also see his driving creativity on multiple occasions. Melissa and Ralph are portrayed as a loving couple, but not without their flaws. They do have outbursts from time to time. Them starting a newspaper in the first season is also an example of how the show evolved. This was not just a one-off story. The Evergreen Standard became an important part of the raccoon's development for the rest of the series. Schaefer also opened a cafe later in the show's run that became another setting for the characters to go to. Something that was dropped after the first season, though, were the humans. The forest ranger and his two children, who were previously introduced in the specials, usually existed as a parallel story with whatever the animals were doing. However, I can understand why they disappeared after season one, as they never seemed aware that the animals were anthropomorphic, and that created too many questions. How could they not notice the millionaire aardvark and his mansion? While a number of episodes had a slice-of-life feel, or involved some sort of comedic mishap, the raccoons were also willing to put the characters in perilous situations. That gave it a sense of adventure, and resulted in some episodes where the stakes were definitely there. Whether it's the one where Cedric gets trapped in his father's vault, or the episode where Bert and Cedric get stuck on an island. The show also tackled its environmental themes with the needed maturity and in a way that hopefully got through to the audience. In one fifth season episode, the pigs contaminate a beloved waterhole, and it's the rare episode that does not result in the raccoons saving the day, as the characters acknowledge how much damage has been caused and the difficulty in reversing it. The series did not just tackle contamination and deforestation, though. A common theme was about the deceitfulness of cheating, as we see Cyril or the pigs cook up some scheme that they think will reverse their fortunes, but they eventually see the consequences of this. One of the best episodes has Cyril put together a rigged potato chip contest, and we see the addictive effect it ultimately has on Bert. There was also an anti-smoking episode. These were common for cartoons at the time, but the raccoons was able to do it in a way that acknowledged not only the peer pressure and health risks that come from smoking, but also the difficulties of quitting. 
Cyril is, after all, always shown with a cigar, and the writer smartly had him deliver the final message. The show even addressed the nature of politics in an episode where Bert and Cyril run for mayor of the Evergreen Forest. It goes through the steps of a campaign and the necessity of a clean election process, resulting in a smart episode. A major component of the raccoons came from the music. Gillis and John Stroll's score really added to the atmosphere of the show, with specifically motifs written for each character. There was almost a Peter and the Wolf feel, and how whenever someone like Bert or Cyril or the pigs entered the scene, you knew exactly which piece of music would play. There was also a sentimental theme, an adventure theme, a danger theme, and other great instrumental pieces. However, what a lot of people remember are the songs. The middle of each episode contained a song, and what's amazing is how fantastic each one is. These are incredibly catchy songs, which were primarily performed by Lisa Lockheed, who also voiced the character Lisa Raccoon. Stop the Clock, Growing Up, and Here I Go Again are some of the more familiar tunes for fans of the show. But the most well-remembered is the theme song, Run With Us, which played over the end credits. This might be one of the best songs written for an animated series, with its catchy melody and unforgettable lyrics. A music video was even produced for Run With Us, which served as an incredible 80s time capsule. The show's visual style is incredibly appealing, too, and add to the richness of the world. The evergreen forest has the needed beauty, and it makes sense why the animals feel such pride in the place. The character animation also deserves commending, as the animators give a lot of personality, and the designs are charming and distinct. The entire show is animated in Ottawa, first at Atkinson Film Arts, and then Hinton Animation Studios, and employed some top Canadian talent to work on it. Disney animator Nick Ranieri, who animated Hades and Hercules, and fittingly Miko the Raccoon in Pocahontas, was an animator during the first season. And Rick Sloiter, who served as an art director on Mulan, and Lilo and Stitch, was a background artist on the Raccoons. Kevin Gillis had planned a few times to make a theatrical movie, but it never panned out for whatever reason. Which is a shame, because I can absolutely imagine a big screen adventure with the Raccoons being something quite special. Either way, through its 60 episodes, The Raccoons was able to offer an original animated series with lovable characters and its own sound unique from other 80s cartoons. If you've never watched The Raccoons, or you want to revisit it, the production company's official YouTube channel recently made all the episodes available to watch for free. And there might be new raccoon stories to come in the future. Gillis announced a few years ago that another series was being developed by Big Jump Entertainment, an animation studio based in Ottawa. It's impressive that, after all these years, the raccoons has not strayed far from its roots. The new character designs were revealed on Big Jump's official website, and while certainly different from the original show, these designs do have their own charm, and the personalities of Bert, Cyril, and the other characters manage to shine through. However, the last update I've managed to find is from 2018, so I don't know what the current status is on the new raccoons. Hopefully, we'll hear something soon. In the end, Kevin Gillis created something special, and The Raccoons definitely stands as a notable achievement in Canadian television. See you next time.